go ahead and give it a turn. Yeah, awesome. record that in progress now. So you will have, you know, since we share this, you will have this recording as well. Perfect. All right. Well, now I will introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Khalid Bawarsi. He graduated from medical school in 2010. He did his residency at WVU Charleston in two specialties, internal medicine and psychiatry. So fun fact, there's only about 10 um, such intensive integrated residency programs in the U.S. that um, altogether produce about 20 dual trained physicians. So we are very lucky to have him today. Um, he received the Outstanding Educator Award for Excellence in Clinical Teaching and served as the Chief Resident Physician for Medicine Psychiatry, um, taking both leadership positions at once. So after, after his uh, residency, he worked as a staff physician for the same hospital system. Um, he also served as a clinical instructor for the medicine and psychiatry clinic, training um, other physicians and teaching medical students. Uh, he worked as um, an inpatient psychiatrist uh, at the Medical Center of Trinity and did his fellowship TMS training at Duke University in 2019. He founded Florida TMS Clinic shortly after. Uh, he is double board certified in internal medicine and psychiatry and is a member of the American Psychiatric Association and a member of the Clinical TMS Society. Thank you so much for teaching us today, Dr. Borarshi. I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. And hopefully this will be a fun hour uh, for, 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 for the most part um, and a little bit educational about the crisis of mental health in uh, our community and particularly depression. Um, I Before starting, I just want to thank North Tampa Behavioral Health for the support that you guys are providing in our community. Uh, here at uh, Florida TMS Clinic in Wesley Chapel, we often share patients with the North Tampa Behavioral Health Hospital, uh, sending them either for IOP, Intensive Outpatient Program, or Partial Hospitalization Program. And we feel very supported with this uh, service being available in our backyard. And um, that, that, that I have to give credit when it's due. I really appreciate that support that we have in here. And that was one of the factors how we chose this location for our main campus when we started the clinic. Now we're expanding to other areas that are a little bit farther away from uh, North Tampa Behavioral Health. But you know this is what's unique about uh, this proximity and location between our clinic and uh, North Tampa. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what's beyond medicine for treatment of depression. Um, we, we're gonna have a few objectives, but before uh, starting, I just wanna make sure that uh, um, we have a, a financial disclosure, um, which is usually required you know, for any um, educational talk. I don't have any financial conflict of interest with any pharmaceutical company or TMS manufacturer or any healthcare system. Uh, the only um, a practice that I own is Florida TMS Clinic, and uh, I don't have any other um, a conflict of interest to report. So we're going to talk about why this is important. We're going to talk about the mental health crisis. We're going to talk about our next generation who is coming up to the workforce uh, here in the next, you know, about 10 years or so, and how this is going to reshape uh, the uh, crisis of mental health, even, even a little bit to a, a worse prognosis. We're going to talk about depression and how COVID affected um, our mental health generally, and partic particularly for depression and anxiety. We're going to talk about what's available today for treatment of major depressive disorder. What are the modern treatments that are available for major depressive disorder, like in my clinic? you know, not available in every clinic. And then we're going to talk about what is the future in this field over time. And when we talk about the future, there is a, you know, short-term future in the next 10, sorry, next two to three years. And there is long-term future. We're talking about 10 to 20 years from now. So hopefully it would be a little bit interesting. Stay to the end and I will explain to you how uh, Elon Musk is also getting his, uh, his interest in mental health and how he's going to be participating in the next revolution of psychiatry treatment. So why is it important? Um, obviously, most of the participants in this in this uh, educational um, um, uh, lecture, you know, do have some kind of uh, background. M most of you are in mental health uh, field, you know, whether therapist or nurse practitioners or um, uh, interested in this field generally. So you have firsthand experience with depression and anxiety. Generally, we are facing a mental health crisis, and the main issue in here is that one, it's very common to have you know, depression and anxiety and other mental health issues, but depression and anxiety particularly are very common in our in our society. Number two is that we have a stigma with it, right? You know, patients or, or people generally don't like to talk about it as much. Don't, uh, they, they fear a little bit um, when it comes to seeking mental health care. Um, uh, 
we talked a little bit about my background of being internal medicine and psychiatry at the same time. That was part of it. That was part of why I wanted to break into the stigma that I wanted to make sure that patients know that both your physical health and mental health are equal. Uh, technically, nowadays, it might be even more important than physical health. Uh, we do have predictors of deterioration of physical health. We'll get to COVID in a second, how mental health could actually be a, a part of this. Um, it's difficult to treat. Um, again, you guys do that on a daily basis. You know how difficult it is to kind of get somebody with major depressive disorder to get better. And I'm talking about I'm talking about clinical depression in here. I'm not talking about somebody who broke up, you know, a relationship or you know had a little bit of an adjustment difficulty with depressive symptoms that obviously need treated and need to be addressed so it doesn't progress into clinical depression depression over time. But once you reach clinical depression, once a patient is in severe depressive episode, they're thinking about ending their lives, or they have suicidal thoughts or self-harm thoughts and what have you, that is difficult to treat. That is not easy to kind of manage over time. So that's why this is, you know, kind of, kind of important topic. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the mental health crisis in the United States of America, right? So, you know, major depression is uh, very common. It's estimated to affect 19.3 million Americans in 2019. This number is actually before COVID. After COVID, we have higher number of clinical depression. Now, that's the, the full spectrum of depression. That's not treatment-resistant depression. So you have mild, moderate, severe, and severe depression could have, you know, just severe depression, and it could treatment-resistant depression. So I know that this number is large, you know, but maybe a quarter of those patients, sorry, a third of those patients will have treatment resistant depression, but I just want to kind of make sure that we're aware of the numbers in here. According to the World Health Organization, you know, an organization that we used to love a lot, you know, not everybody loves it anymore, you know, since, <laughs> since COVID, but they, they give us a little bit of an insight of uh, how, how big this problem is. It is actually the leading cause of disability worldwide. And I want you to stop here for one second and think about it for a little bit. We know that the leading cause of mortality, meaning death in the United States of America, is cardiovascular diseases, and it's still number one, okay? So this is how we exit life. But it's not really the number one leading cause of disability, you know, um, and that there are multiple factors of how you calculate disability. So if we're talking about somebody with a heart attack or heart disease, we're talking about someone who is in their 70s, maybe 80s. Um, if you have a heart attack, you're going to be hospitalized for about a week or so. You're going to get a stent in your heart. You're going to get out of the hospital, maybe a little bit of cardiac rehab after that for a month or two. But then you can go back to your normal functions that you were doing before until the next heart attack happens in 10 years, 20 years or what have you. A depression is a little different. One, it's affecting younger people, right? You know, so you start having depression, you know, maybe in your 30s or something like that, right? So you have way longer period of time living with depression. Number two is because it's more difficult to treat and it takes longer time, we're taking you out of the workforce for a longer period of time, right? And mortality, meaning death, does not happen always with depression. We know we have 17,000 cases of uh, suicide in the country every year, but that number is significantly less than what coronary artery disease would do, right? You know, coronary artery disease could kill you, you know, if you have a heart attack. So it doesn't kill you. It will disable you. You're not going to be joining workforce. It affects you in a younger age. So that's why it's more disabling than a lot of physical illnesses. Um, fun fact, I think the second, uh, the second one on uh, the mortality reason of death in the United States of America used to be cancer. But I think for 2020, COVID took over. I think it's the second cause of death uh, for that year. So it's an outliner, you know, for infectious diseases to be a reason of, uh, uh, to, to, to be on the top list of reason of mortality in a developed country. Um, but that's where we are now. Okay, now another important factor in here is the um, uh, uh, burden of depression. So, uh, this is an important factor when we're talking about the healthcare system or an insurance company or our tax money of how are we going to make sure that we spend it wisely. So oftentimes you will have insurances and decision makers, you know, kind of putting their focus on physical health and ignoring mental health. That's the biggest mistake that anybody could make, could make because from the money standpoint, even 
um, the spend um, that and the opportunity cost that comes out of mental health is huge. So about $210 billion every year is lost because of depression. Now, I know nowadays we're saying billions and we don't care that much because, you know, every every politician and their mom is spending like a few trillion dollars on every bill that they submit and what have you. But this is annually. So we're talking about, you know, in 10 years, this number is going to be huge, right? So, you know, trying to save cost in here is really important. Uh, and when we say cost, meaning treating depression soon so we can get this person back in the workforce so they add to society and we can produce more as a nation and as, as humanity generally. Okay. All right. Um, let's, uh, you know, this is, this is a graph that's going to show you the prevalence. So one in five Americans will have some clinical depression in their lifetime, but 8.3, 27 uh, millions will have clinical depression for 2020. I told you about 2019 was 19 millions. It's disabling. I already told you this fact, $210 billion every year is, is opportunity cost because of depression and treatment and um, uh, opportunity cost in there. And the third part that is important about depression is that our current treatments are um, not the best. Um, first of all, it takes time, you know, for somebody to get better with depression. It takes between four to 14 weeks uh, before you consider an SSRI, whether it was effective or not, right? You cannot prescribe Prozac and tell the patient, oh, tomorrow we're going to see if it worked or not. You actually need to give it, you know, four weeks, eight weeks, you know, before you kind of see uh, whether this medication was effective or not. And the second part of this is that efficacy with antidepressants is not as good as we want it to be. All right, um, this is another graph showing you, it's actually a snapshot of what uh, the disability weight of illnesses is generally. You would see that moderate depression is a little bit less disabling than having a heart attack and it's um, less disabling than dying of cancer without treatment, but severe depression, depressive episode that is severe is actually more disabling than those two I just mentioned, having a heart attack or dying of cancer, right? And for a second, you know, all of, uh, all of the folks who do have to, who criticize mental health generally, or they don't understand depression, or they haven't been around, you know, either a depressed patient or a depressed family member, or they don't practice mental health care and what have you, they could put down, you know, mental health some, but they're, they're missing on something really important in here. Okay, so, we know that we have a mental health crisis already. Is it getting better or is it gonna get worse over time? And what are the contributing factors? Well, unfortunately, it might be getting worse over time. So there is a lot of uh, effect of technology and social media on, on mental health. Uh, now, I know this topic had been, had been used uh, often in, 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 in the media and uh, in coverage generally of how uh, social media is affecting um, the, the, new, the newer generation. And we'll get to that in, to, in, you know, in, in a little bit. But I want you to be thinking about this of any revolution that happens in humanity. There are things that will improve our life immediately, but we don't know what are the long-term consequences of them. The issue is that we cannot stop it. You can't really stop. You cannot tell people, don't go on social media. Don't, don't open your Facebook anymore. Don't go on Instagram. Please avoid TikTok. You can't really do that. What you can do is protect the newer generation by limiting the exposure until their brain is mature enough so they will have less negative consequences out of this. And we'll talk into details a little bit in a second. Uh, screen time is associated with more mood issues. All of this is studied and documented, and we know those for facts. So I want you to look at this graph for a little bit of time, just to have an idea of our next generation, of how uh, depression and anxiety is going to be more prevalent in, in the next generation than it is already now. So this graph in here is showing you on this X uh, axis in here, showing you the year. So this is year 2004, 2005, 2006, all the way to 2016. And here on the Y axis, you have the percentage of, of uh, the population in that age group that has depression uh, or uh, a major depressive episode. The one in blue is a major depressive episode that did not require treatment, no medications or hospitalization. The one in red is the one that required treatment, whether medications or hospitalization. And notice how teens, this is looking at teens from the age of 12 to 17, they were having about 5% you know, um, prevalence of depression that required treatment and about 10% um, uh, a year um, of the depression that did not require treatment. And it was flat for so many years, all the way until year 2011, 2012. 
something happened around that time that we started going into upward trajectory year over year of the prevalence of depression that required treatment or the depression that did not require treatment. And what happened around that time that pushed this graph for our teens, you know, to be more depressed? There must have been something, right? You know, these, these data are collected by the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. You know, this is, you know, one of the subsidiary of the NIH. And they were collecting this data for many years. Um, and then you have this jump in here. So it, it, the, the, the main thing that happened around that, that year in 2011, 2012, is the introduction of 4G networks, right? You know, so we used to have social media. We had Facebook since what 2004 or so. So you know, people were able to kind of get exposed to those kind of things, but they were tied to their computer. They were tied to a place where they were doing this. It wasn't really haunting us everywhere where we go, until I think it was iPhone 4 or iPhone 5 that had 4G um, into it capability. So before that, you know, Apple usually is a couple of years behind on adding the most recent uh, network. Um, but I think 2009 is when we had 4G widespread in the United States. 2011 is when it was widely adopted, and that's when the iPhone came up with, with 4G. Once you had 4G, now you have this accessibility on your phone everywhere, right? And now it became part of your life. Now, for an adult, they might have the ability because of the uh, mature uh, frontal lobe cortex to kind of suppress those urges to have this... Uh, Introjection, what we call it. So projection is when you project your feeling outside. Introjection is when you get a feeling from outside and you interject it in yourself. So I want you to imagine this, this uh, uh, young girl who is uh, just getting on Instagram or Facebook and posing a couple of uh, pictures or putting a couple of statements and she gets from her subscribers or from her followers or her families and friends, she gets a thousand likes on her picture. She's going to love it, right? There is a dopamine surge that happens in the brain at that moment. Um, you, there, there might be some, some, some possibility of being lonely in real life and that replacing that, you know, immediately. She's going hook, to be hooked to it pretty quickly and she's going to post another picture. And that other picture is going to get another thousand likes. And then she's going to post another one and then another one. And then at some point, engagement might not be as strong or engagement is still as strong, but her brain got used to the, to the thousand likes that she had before and now she wants more well that kind of rings some bells right you know if we had a patient who's getting xanax uh, to help someone with an anxiety and you know two milligrams a day were doing the trick over time that's not going to do the trick anymore they're going to ask for more xanax and now they want it four times a day right so this is called tolerance in psychiatry so now that exposure that you had of those interjection uh, interjection feelings when you're having likes and we having comments and you're having those people who are like you're amazing you're awesome and those feedback that comes from the outside without real tangible relationships is actually getting tolerated over time. You're developing tolerance to this, right? So you're not having the same search. So now this team wants to actually post even more things to kind of get higher numbers of likes. They want to go on other social media platforms to do the same thing as well. And then at some point, you're gonna have some cyberbullying kind of situation when another kid at school or somebody who she never met or he never met, and they're gonna throw a negative comment in there. And they're gonna say, oh, we're tired of this or, you know, Something, something negative to this person. What's going to happen now? They're going to get depressed. They're going to get withdrawal, right? You know, so similar to what happens with any uh, substance of use or any um, uh, 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 addictive uh, object or material that we could we could expose our brain to. Now. Again, this is something that is being looked at. I mean, it's, it's not only psychiatrists who are looking into this or psychologists who are looking into this. Actually, the social media algorithms are looking into this because they actually want people to get addicted. That's how they make money. But at the same time, they don't want to have the negative reputation. So they're trying to kind of minimize that a little bit. Hopefully, at some point, it would be minimized. But I just wanted to show you this graph because if this continue in this trajectory upwards, we're going to face about 20%, if, if not more, of our population being depressed um, as they, they join the workforce over time. More interesting in the same graphs and the same data that was obtained uh, by the National Survey for Drug Use and Health, if we break it down into girls and boys, um, so this is the same data that I showed you in the previous slide in here and how it peaked, you know, between 2011 to 2012, you know, started going, going upwards. If we break it down into boys and girls, on the left side, we have girls. And the one in dark green are the percentage of girls who had depressive symptoms that did not require 
treatment and the one in lighter green are the girls who had depressive symptoms that required treatment. Notice how around that time from 2011, 2012, when this has started peaking up, it actually is more significant for the female gender than it is for the male gender. So it doubled from around 10% to about 20% in the span of about four years or so, uh, four or five years. While for boys, it increased, but not as much as for girls. And that's what I was talking about with interjection of feelings that I just mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. And, and this plays into the psychology of how boys get kind of more attached to video games and stuff of this sort, rather than, you know, being dependent on relationships with likes and shares and stuff of this on social media. And uh, video games could be more predictable in the skills and the feedback that goes with the dopamine surge rather than you know, the likes and shares on social media, because that's not predictable. This is dependent on other folks um, uh, a little bit more. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. I'm not, I'm not saying that boys are safer to be on social media than, than girls. I think both of them, we just need to be careful of how are we doing this? And do we need to protect our children from using such a tool until their, their brain is mature, until the age of you know 18 or older? Basically, if you're talking to a neuroscientist, they will tell you brain will finish forming around the age of like maybe 26 or so. So preferably full access should be around the age of 26, but I know uh, nobody's gonna like this idea. Interestingly, um, I think I think a couple of years ago when every day I was uh, driving out of my uh, house, you know, going to work, there is this corner um, that I take every day that is a, a basically a wait and stop for uh, uh, kids, um, uh, middle school and high school kids, you know, while they're waiting for the school bus. And I had this observation on how like you will have 10 teens, you know, standing next to each other at that bus stop, you know, waiting for their school bus. And every single one of them has their head down and they're on their phone typing with their thumbs, right? And they're just like maybe a foot away from the next person next to them. And I'm like, I bet that they're, com you know, communicating with another teen, right? Like this is another human being teen who is somewhere else at another bus stop. Why not communicating with the one just next to you? Like, isn't that a little bit healthier? But anyways, COVID happened. And now the same scene I can see, but instead of like one feet apart, they are like six feet apart. And, but they're still down with a mask on their face. But it still continues. Yeah, we, ha we have to be aware of that. I'm not criticizing. I'm not criticizing. I'm not going to take phones away from folks or anything like that, but I just want to make sure that they're aware of this. This is another graph that you guys are going to love if you kind of take a closer look at that. Um, of uh, um, uh, screen time, I'm sorry, uh, screen time uh, for teenagers. Uh, so this one looks at how much time, screen time you're spending and the prevalence of depression and anxiety over time, okay? And notice how the longer the, the X axis in here is number of hours per day, the more hours that you're spending looking at the screen increases the chances of depression and anxiety over time. And this is also for teenagers. Um, and uh, notice that less than one hour also has higher association with depression and anxiety, but this is a little bit of a uh, biased data because, you know, those kids most likely have other mental health issues and that's why they're not on screen at all. You know, this is either autism or intellectual disability or something of this sort. You have to look at more than one hour. So the longer time screen time, the higher chances of depression and anxiety and screen time here is TV, tablets, phone. And what have you. So we cannot, and this is published in JAMA Pediatrics of 2019. This is a very large trial that included so many kids, and it took a lot of time to kind of conclude those results. So it's not uh, a conspiracy. It's not something that you're, you know, seeing, you know, on videos and what have. It's actually reality. We know that already. We don't know what to do for it yet, but we know that already. Okay, so you're telling me things are bad currently, and they're going to get worse over time. Well, yeah, well, let's let's. Uh, <laughs> Hold on for a little bit. They actually got worse already with COVID-19, unfortunately. So COVID-19, um, in multiple surveys that were done, there was the estimation is that it increased depressive symptoms threefold, um, and that was published in JAMA of 2020. And then you have people with depressive and anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder are experiencing detrimental impact because of their mental health from COVID-19 pandemic that was published in Lancet uh, 2021. We know that already, you guys know that already at North Tampa Behavioral Health as well, because patients have limited access now to mental health care because of all the quarantines and the limitation that we had, you know, because of uh, COVID. 
and more 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 as well you know if you're looking at survivors of covid-19 appears to be at increased risk of psychiatric sequela this is the long hauler that we're talking about in media now and how you know even if you recovered from covid-19 infection you could have long term depression and anxiety symptoms psychiatric diagnosis could be independent risk factor for covid-19 think about that for a second if you have two people who get admitted to a hospital because of covid-19 infection the one with mental health issues could have worse prognosis than the one without mental health issues. This is not surprising to me because that's what we see in um, diabetic patients who do have mental health issues as well. They have worse prognosis. You know, this is, if somebody has coronary artery disease and mental health issues, they have worse prognosis. So this is already known, but you know, even for acute infections now, it seems to be the case as well. And, and I want to kind of take a little bit of time here just to explain to you that that principle in here. It's not only, you know, obviously it's a factor, you know, when you're quarantining people, you know, if somebody had co coronavirus, they're going to feel sick themselves, right? And when you feel sick, tired, fatigued, your energy is down and you have depression already, that is going to worsen your depression. Also, we're asking this person to quarantine. So that's leading to social isolation, right? So that is also kind of be a factor for depressive episode. Um, you have the uh, financial um, worries that people would have, you know, when you're losing jobs, closing down and what have you and stuff of this sort. So all of those are psychosocial factors that will contribute to increased incidence of depression and anxiety during coronavirus. But there's something a little bit beyond that. You know, you have medications that you're taking now for coronavirus, right? So if you are on steroids uh, because of COVID, you know, you're going to get a little bit more anxious, sometimes agitated because of the effect of steroids on the brain. Also, coronavirus particles were detected in the CSF, like the cerebrospinal fluids. That means the DNA of it, you know, so that, that means that um, we might be actually facing encephalitis that is happening um, because of coronavirus itself. It's actually infecting the brain, and this could have the long-term um, uh, consequences that we're talking about in here. Remember that one of the early signs of uh, uh, coronavirus is uh, olfactory nerve involvement, meaning that you will lose sense of smell or some patients will lose sense of smell independent of congestions of congest nasal congestion, congestion. So even once you are recovering coronavirus and you're not having nasal congestion anymore, some patients will lag behind in their sense of smell coming back and some would never have it back. What does that mean? That means that there is a, a, a direct involvement of your central nervous system or your olfactory nerve with coronavirus, right? So if that is evident, then maybe some of the uh, mental health sequela that we're talking about with coronavirus could be um, uh, immediate result because of the encephalitis or an infection of the brain that happens as well. Okay, so we know that we have a problem with mental health issues. We know that the future is not that promising. We know that the recent crisis that we had with coronavirus made things worse. You gotta tell me some good news. Tell me you have the solution for this. Like what, what are the current treatment options that we have? Well, thankfully, we have things that we ha that have been tried for tens and years, uh, tens of years, and they have been some of them have been effective. And we are going to go through what we have done in the past and how how uh, psychiatry is evolving over time. So, we have psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is still the first line treatment for depression and anxiety. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say this again. I know a lot of a lot of the attendees in here are therapists. And we have always this kind of like think or thought that psychiatrists or medical doctors don't believe in therapy. That's absolutely not true. We actually recommend the first line treatment of uh, depression and anxiety to be psychotherapy. And we need to make sure that every patient knows about that because you don't have side effects of psychotherapy. Well, with the exception if you know you were really nasty patient and then your therapist you know punch you in the face uh, but i haven't i haven't seen that in my lifetime so but you know generally there are no side effects of psychotherapy and we're talking about evidence-based psychotherapy uh cognitive behavioral therapy exposure response prevention therapy interpersonal therapy or ipt problem solving therapy pst uh, dialectical behavioral therapy which we use for borderline personality disorder but it has data that's beneficial as well for mdd those therapies are effective. Psychodynamic psychotherapy or psychoanalysis is actually effective in depression and it has more long-term um, uh, benefit or durability compared to short, shorter duration of uh, psychotherapies. So I want you to keep that in mind. This is effective. 
The exception or the problem will come up if we have severe depression, if we have somebody with suicidal ideation, right? Are we gonna just do psychotherapy and you know just take our chances? Probably not. Now, because we have severe case, now we need to do both. We need to do psychotherapy and medication antidepressants at the same time. And the good news is that medications, since the revolution of medications in the 50s, 60s, basically, they're getting better. You know, so back in the 60s, we only had TCAs. Now we have a lot of better SSRIs that have less side effects, not not no side effects, you know, there are plenty of side effects, but less side effects, you know, compared to previous medications. So today, what we treat with is usually SSRIs. This is SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This is a like of Zoloft, Selexa, Lexapro, Paxil, Prozac, uh, Lovox, and currently Trentelix, Vibrid, or newer medications, or SNRIs, uh, serotonin or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Those are the likes of Cymbalta, Effexor, and maybe Pristique, um, those kind of medications. And then you have NDRIs, you know, those are norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors. This is the like of Propion or Wellbutron. You have TCAs. This is the medication medications that we use to use like nortriptyline, amitriptyline. They had more side effects, you know, some cardiac issues that could happen with arrhythmias with those medications, a lot of weight gain, a lot of sedation. So we don't use them as much now. You know, if you have a patient who's on TCA, they're either old and they inherited that from a previous old school practice of medicine, or they are on a significantly smaller dose for the reason of insomnia or not sleeping well. So we add a TCA in this situation. And you have atypicals antidepressants like Remeron or Mirtazapine, which works on multiple, multiple factors at the same time. You have you, you add augmentation treatment like mood stabilizers of the like antipsychotics, second generation antipsychotics like Abilify or Rexulti nowadays is getting a lot of uh, traction, Latuda, Geodon, Seroquel, and what have you. So those are the medicines that we have been using. Okay, what else do we have? Well, we have North Tampa Behavioral Health, right? We have IOP, you know, intensive outpatient program and partial hospitalization program. So this is when your patient is at a severe point that you did individual therapy, you know, that one session a week or what have you, they're not responding that well. You added medications, they're not responding that well. Well, things, you know, we have to do something about it or we're gonna end up in inpatient settings, which is necessary sometimes, right? But before we get to that point, maybe we can do IOP, right? Or we can do partial hospitalization program. Or if you ended up with Baker Act, you know, because of, you know, safety towards yourself or others and what have you. And now we want to transition you out of the hospital. We might get you into partial hospitalization program or intensive outpatient program. By the way, shout out here to North Tampa Behavioral Hospital. Again, I know that I have said that so many times now, but I really need to do this because this is basically combining the number one and number two at the same time in more intensive way and in more higher quality because you have the doctor, Dr. Khan at, at North Tampa Behavioral Health and his team seeing the patient basically on weekly basis and adjusting their medications and making sure that they're not having the side effects, you know, that could come off the medicine or adjusting medicines and what have you. So those two to three months of IOP are basically the peak of what you can get as a service here in, in Wesley Chapel area. All right, what if that doesn't work, okay? What if we got to the point of psychotherapy, we got to a point of uh, uh, medication antidepressants, we are going more intensified with uh, intensive outpatient treatment, is there something else that is that is currently available? And the answer is thankfully, yes. The problem is not everybody knows about it and not every psychiatrist practice this. So for example, we have ECT or shock therapy. And I know there is a lot of negative opinion about ECT, so we'll get to that in a second. There is a new a newer a newer thing it's not newer it's 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 been out for for a while now which is tms or transcranial magnetic stimulation that's what i practice on daily basis there is tdcs which is transdermal direct current stimulation which is a stimulation device that could be used at home there is vns or vagal nerve stimulator there is dps which is deep brain stimulator there is esketamine psychedelic kind of drug that could help with uh, with uh, with uh, treatment resistant depression which we are going to start our first esketamine patient in the next week um so we we at florida tms clinic we specialize in treatment resistant depression and we utilize out of this tms or transcranial magnetic stimulation and esketamine for patients who do not respond to tms so just a general uh, dr of... bowarski i'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt <laughs> we um you have such a great flow going. I'm so sorry. We did have one of our um, attendees get kicked out of the meeting. Could you check the wait list real quick and see if you could readmit her? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. 
So participants. It's a perfect little break for everyone to just let all that sink in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. When you message. Okay. I see the messages in here, but I don't know how to bring the participants back. If it's um at the very bottom where it has the participants, you see the participant names on the right yeah. side. If if anyone's waiting, it should be up there saying waiting room. But if no one's there, then right, it's been. not showing me a waiting room. Um, the participant okay. window is coming from the top for me, um, okay. and yeah, I don't see any. I just see the actual participants in here. She so. might still be having some trouble, so we'll be sure to get her the recording so she can see the rest. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So sorry to interrupt. Please continue. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> and I see some some questions are uh, coming up. I will get to those. We will have ten minutes of questions. Hopefully, well, I don't know if we will get to. You know, I'll try to cut it. Uh, you know, not not to be as intentional. Not talking that much. All right. So this graph is a little bit a little bit uh, uh, of a summary of all all things together, right? So you know, if we're looking at psychotherapy or monotherapy for patients, as I said, who have mild to moderate clinical depression, you have about fifty percent chance of this person responded to cognitive behavioral therapy, about 40% chance of them getting into remission. So response is actually a decrease of symptoms by 50%, and remission is no depressive symptoms or PHQ-9 less than 5. If we do both psychotherapy and antidepressants, that's what I was talking about with what we do at North Tampa Behavioral Hospital, you know, doing IOP and medication management at the same time, you have about 70% response rate and you have almost 50, sorry, uh, almost 50 percent remission rate. Okay, well, let's talk about medications a little bit more. So the first trial, if it was by its own, you have a little bit less than 50% response rate. The second trial of antidepressant, it goes down to about 25, 30% or so actually in a different uh, different rating scale these numbers are actually worse than this you know the rating scales that we use for tms response the numbers will go from like around 30 percent to 21 percent with the second trial to around 16 percent on the third trial to only 6.9 percent at the at the fourth trial of an antidepressant so if we take a patient who was you know reached the fourth trial of antidepressant and we want to see if TMS would help with this patient, transcranial magnetic stimulation on its own, those population or this population of patients will have about 58% response rate, which is really good news, and remission rate of around 37, 38%. That's good news. Now, imagine if we do TMS and psychotherapy at the same time, we have even better numbers. Then your response rate will be around 67%. Your remission rate would be over 50%. So remember when I was talking about the IOP program and how like, you know, when you're doing medications and therapy at the same time, it would be beneficial. Well, imagine if you have somebody who has severe depression, suicidal ideation, they tried medications, nothing, nothing helped them in the past. And now we bring them for brain stimulation with TMS. So we're doing the magnetic stimulation every day for this patient. And they actually are going to IOP, right? So they are doing, you know, uh, four, four, four to six hours of uh, psychotherapy every day in group therapy, individual therapy, and they're seeing the doctor and we're adjusting their medications. That is actually the best of both worlds because now your brain circuits that have been a hypoactive because of your depressive symptoms are getting more activated both magnetically and behaviorally when you're going through therapy and what have you. And this is this is done, and there is a lot of concentration now of trying to kind of combine both approaches, you know, psychotherapy and brain stimulation using magnetic stimulation at the same time. And the future is promising to a point that I think at some point insurances are going to require that psychotherapy is ongoing while you're doing TMS. Okay, so the current modern treatments for, for treatment-resistant depression. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Number two is esketamine or spravato. And, and that's, I know it's a brand name medication. And, uh, you know, as I told you in the financial disclosure, I have nothing to do with any pharmaceutical company, but this is just the first drug to, to be approved from that class of medication. Things are going to can improve over time. So let's talk briefly about TMS. TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. Simply, it's magnetic therapy of the brain. What we're trying to do is we're trying to activate neurons or brain cells in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the brain using magnetic fields. So electricity is actually going through the machine, not through your body. What goes through your body is the magnetic pulse itself. 
similar in intensity to an MRI machine. And magnetic pulses or electromagnetic fields generally are safe so far or fairly safe so far in human beings. This is similar to your 5G network or your Wi-Fi network or your radio signal or TV signal and what have you. And I know, I know some people are paranoid about 5G and they think it's affecting our mental health and affecting, you know, a lot of our physical health and they think that COVID, COVID is a result of 5G. Um, but th that's, that doesn't have evidence, clinical evidence at this point. And besides, even if that in the future we think that maybe you know certain electromagnetic fields are affecting our body negatively when you're actually doing it targeted when you're actually using a magnetic field to an area therapeutically that is beneficial you know the similar to light therapy right or similar to laser you know when you're doing procedures in the eyes and what have you and stuff like that of course laser exposure you know without an intent is not going to be helpful but the one with intent and with targeting is, is important how old is dms how long has it been around it's actually as old as I am. It was uh, created, the first machine was created in 1985. Now, the protocols for treatment of depression are the ones that are kind of newer. So in 2008, it was approved by the FDA for treatment of depression. In 2009, it became commercially available in the United States of America, but it was invented in the United Kingdom back in 1985. It's currently covered by insurance. So any insurance that crosses your mind, um, except for Florida Medicaid, uh, does not cover for TMS, but any other insurance, they have to have a policy for TMS. The evidence is so solid behind it that they have to have this insurance. I'm talking about Medicare. I'm talking about TRICARE. I'm talking about Aetna, Cigna, United, Blue, all of those insurances, they do have policy for, for, for TMS. And I, I want to stop at TRICARE for a second in here because I know that this is one of the excellent things at North Tampa Behavioral Health is that we have the core program, which is aimed at our military service uh, men and women. And uh, TRICARE, you know, puts a lot of effort into making sure that we have all the mental health services available for our service men and women. And they actually have the easiest criteria for TMS. So if a patient had tried psychotherapy in the past and tried one antidepressant in the past and they did not respond, they can qualify for TMS. And we had a lot of success stories. We shared some of, uh, of, of the patients with North Tampa Behavioral uh, Health. One of the cases that crossed my mind is a, a patient who uh, was a young athlete, um, a very smart kid, ended up at Mayo Clinic. I'm not talking about Mayo Clinic in Florida. I'm talking about the main campus in Minnesota. And they referred them over you know, to, to us in here for TMS. And at the same time, we hooked them up with North Tampa Behavioral Health for uh, the intensive outpatient program. Or I don't recall, it might have been, I think he's in IOP. He was in IOP, not in, in core. But amazing results during, during the patient treatment. And I still follow up on the patient. They're still doing really well. Um, it would not have happened without the help of North Tampa Behavioral Health, you know, for the IOP component of things. And it would not have happened if it wasn't for the support that TRICARE does for, for again, our military families of making sure that they get the treatment at the lower threshold than other commercial insurances. Okay, um, so Cigna, Aetna, they require two failures of antidepressants. Blue and United, they require four failures of antidepressants, two augmentation and psychotherapy. I know what I said now, might you might not register in your mind. You don't need to worry about it. We have a very, very good uh, office manager, and that's Alexis Sali, uh, who knows every single insurance and she doesn't take no as an answer from any, any insurance if somebody qualifies. So all you need is, you know, basically calling call in our main number um, and, um, you know, given the information of the patient and she calls them back and she figures out whether they meet criteria or not. And if they don't meet the criteria and they still have treatment resistant depression, I can manage their, their, their treatment, uh, you know, until, until we get them where they need to be at that point. Um, okay. So it's covered by insurance. It's widely available now. So, you know, we are, we're in your backyard here in Wesley Chapel. We're open in an office in Curlwood, um, which is going to open next Monday. Um, and hopefully our next patient will be the Monday after. And uh, there are other clinics, there are about 20 TMS clinics in Tampa Bay area. We know all of them and we know what, techni what techniques they use and what machines they use and you know, um, uh, their doctors and what have you. So even if you have a patient who doesn't live nearby, reach out, we're happy to help and refer them to the best doctors that do TMS. This is an illustration of how the machine or how the treatment is. Notice that the patient is completely awake. There is no sedation involved whatsoever. Patient is actually laying in a reclining chair. They're usually watching TV. 
um, or, or just relaxing or watching meditation. You know, some people will kind of get a book with them and read a book, or some people will be on their phone. Remember what we talked about social media, all right? And uh, basically, uh, our our technology, our machine uses navigation system. So you see those reflective balls here on the coil itself. So this box in here is actually where the magnetic coil is is uh, um, um, uh, contained in and uh, the um, patient will have a tracker on their head. So we know in real time where the patient head and where the coil is. So we know that we're delivering the treatment exactly where it needs to be. Um, this is not really our clinic. It's a generic picture, but we might have a picture of our clinic in a second. Just illustration of the, um, uh, uh, the functional MRIs or, or changes in the brain that could happen with depression. I, I cannot. I don't want to put too much emphasis on this yet because the jury is still out on the uh, usability of functional MRI for TMS itself. We think that we can provide individualized treatment by knowing which areas of the brain are actually anti-correlated with something called um, uh, anterior subingual um, cortex of the brain, and that will determine where the DLPFC is or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I know that I'm saying a lot of terminology that you guys might not care about that much, but in the next two to three years, I think there would be newer approvals from the FDA to machines that uses functional connectivity MRI to actually target the treatment where it needs to be. Until then, the navigation system that we have at Florida TMS Clinic is the top top of the uh, technology today. No one else in Tampa Bay area uses navigation system like we do. So we have the best technology in there. And, and I, I'm not saying that we have the best technology out there, you know, to brag, you know, I just want to make sure that when we are doing something for a patient, we're actually doing the best available today. Similar thing for your patient when you're referring them out, you just want to make sure that, okay, why am I sending my patient to this clinic rather than that clinic? I want to make sure that they're getting what's, what's best available today. So what is positive about TMS therapy is that you don't have systemic side effects. So with medications we were talking about, you could have weight gain, you could have stomach side effects, you could have sexual side effects, you could have dry mouth, you can have a little bit of dizziness, lightheadedness, all those kind of things that could happen with medications. Because with TMS, you're going directly to the area of the brain that's affected or hyperactive with depression, you don't have any of those side effects. But that doesn't mean that you don't have side effects at all. I actually don't like the fact that one of my colleagues um, you know, sometimes say that there is no side effects of TMS. There are a couple of things that we need to be, you know, kind of concerned of. Number one, there is risk of seizure. So risk of seizure is extremely rare to happen with TMS, but it is possible. It happens one in 30,000 treatments. And real life clinical data shows that it's actually less common than that. It is one in 89,000 treatments. I haven't had any seizure in my clinic. We've been doing this for about two years now, and we have three treatment chairs. Um, and, and, and hopefully we would never have one, but I still tell my patients about the chances of this. This is important if somebody had seizure disorder already, or somebody was going from alcohol or something like that, or they have been on medications that could put them at seizure risk, or somebody who has anorexia nervosa and they have electrolytes abnormalities, we wanna make sure that we don't end up with a seizure. You might have a little bit of discomfort of the head. When the coil is placed on the side of the head, it gives this tapping sensation on the side of the head. Some patients will describe it as some discomfort. Some patients will have mild to moderate headache. Those patients is about 5% that might have some mild to moderate headache, and it usually goes away after about four to five treatment sessions because you kind of get used to it. And during treatments also, we ask patients to wear earplugs, so we make sure that the noise from the machine, similar to an MRI machine, makes some noise that we protect their hearing and they don't have any tinnitus or ringing in their ears. So that's why I said it's not completely free of, anti uh, of, uh, of side effects, but when you compare it to any medication, it's nothing compared to medications. You know, medications have way, way more things to worry about. Okay, well, what what else is negative? You know, it can't be all, all perfect, right? Well, it requires commitment, right? You know, because you're not only doing it once only, you're doing it every day, five days a week, Monday to Friday for six weeks. So this is total of 30 treatment sessions. So similar to IOP, this change in your, in your brain that you're going to do because of behavioral therapy that you're doing in there is not gonna happen overnight. Nobody is gonna get you into a therapy session for one day and tell you, hey, we're all good. You know, you don't need to come back again. That's not good therapy, right? You probably need to cause long lasting changes in the brain. 
And to do that, you need to be consistent on a daily basis for a few weeks, similar thing with TMS. Um, so that's why I said, you know, ideally, if a patient is going to IOP, then coming back to our clinic after that, doing their TMS and then going, going home, that would be the ideal situation. But we have a lot of patients who are still working, still functioning. They will come into our clinic, they will do their TMS session and then go about their day and do what they have to do. There is no downtime. You can drive yourself in and drive yourself out after treatment. Success rate, I kind of touched on that, 58% response, 38 remission. It's not 100%, like anything in medicine, by the way. And 58% is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, when you're looking at the fourth trial of antidepressant, you have 6.9% chance of responding to an antidepressant when you reach number four. So when you compare that to 58%, you're actually doing malpractice if you don't refer patients for, for TMS. You have to consider that. And I, I know that you know the 42% who do not respond sound, sound like a big number, but that is way less than the 93% chance of not responding uh, when you're trying a fourth antidepressant. This is actually our clinic. You know, that's the same treatment room, treatment chair. This is a tracker on the head that sees where the, where the patient head is and the coil would be on this side of the head in here. Okay, what else is available? Spravato or esketamine. So ketamine, um, and I, I'm, we might be over our time. Please tell me when to stop. Uh, I, I apologize if I take take longer than 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 the time. Um, so if you want me to stop, I'll you know just just give me a hint and then then we'll stop. So esketamine, ketamine was a part of, well, it's a psychedelic drug. Um, it's used in anesthesia. Um, and uh, currently it's not, it's coming out of favor a little bit we got because we have better drugs for anesthesia, but you usually use it for the OR for operations, you know, to put somebody to sleep, you use about 300 to 600 milligrams for a patient. If you use about tens of this, you know, only about 30 to 60 milligrams in an IV infusion, you can help with suicidality and you can help with uh, depressive symptoms. That being said, it was off label. It was not FDA approved. So you had those ketamine clinics popping up every now, you know, here and there and charging thousands of dollars, you know, for ketamine, but that wasn't, did not really have enough safety data to make sure that this is actually well regulated. And then you have in March of 2019, Jensen, which is Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical, they got an FDA approval for esketamine. So any molecule does have two isomers. And you know usually it's an S and R. So they took the S form of ketamine and they made it into spravato, which is intranasal form. There is no needle, there is no infusion going on. Patient will do the spray in their, in their nose. And then they will be monitored in the office for two hours to make sure that if they have some dissociation out of body experience or out of place experience, that they're monitored and safe during that time. They will need somebody to drive them back home for the day. They can drive the next day. So that's a little bit of difference between esketamine and TMS. TMS, they can continue their day without a problem, but with um, uh, esketamine, they have to have somebody you know, to drive them back home. It is very well regulated. There is a RIMS program, you know how clause real, you have to kind of log in every single dose that is given. This is actually even more strict because you cannot take the medicine home. You have to do the medication in our clinic. Um, so that's, uh, that's another good thing about it. The indication of esketamine, by the way, and that's important for you guys at you know, for you guys at North Tampa Behavioral Health. There, there are two indications. One is treatment resistant depression, similar to TMS. But number two, which could be more important for you guys, is uh, acute suicidality. So, say this patient who got Baker acted because of a suicide attempt, or they were suicidal, and they got admitted to North Tampa Behavioral Health. What is the one medicine that you can give today that is the fastest acting to help with their suicidal thoughts? Today, it's actually esketamine. If you ask me this question back in 2018, before it was approved by the FDA, I would tell you maybe lithium. And even that is going to take a little bit of time. I could say Clozero, but even that could take some time. But currently, as of today, esketamine is the fastest acting anti suicidal medication. Okay. So that, that's the nasal spray that we're talking about, just like if you're in, you know, spraying a flow nasal or something like that in your nostril. Um, so side effects, you cannot drive, as I told you, you know, for the rest of the day, not that you're groggy or anything, actually the dissociation gets done after 40 minutes of administering the dose. So we're monitoring for an extra hour just to make sure that everything is fine. It requires two dosages a week for about one month. And then after that one dosage a week for about another month. And then after that, we decide whether we're going to do a dose every two weeks or 
and those are every uh, month or so for the next for the next uh, six months or so. Success rate is about fifty percent. Again, those patients are treatment resistant depression, right? You know, so all of the clinical trials for Spravato, they were recruiting patients who had antidepressant medications before, not not uh, antidepressant naive, except for the trial that looked at suicidality. They were just looking at patients who came into the hospital with suicidality. Is it available? Yes. Now it's going to be available. As I said, you know, starting next week at Florida TMS Clinic, uh, we're going to when we start, we're going to limit it to patients who do not respond to TMS. So those 42% of patients who do not respond to TMS, we're going to do uh, to be doing esketamine. And then hopefully in the next few months, we can have a little bit more collaborative work with North Tampa Behavioral Health to kind of see if somebody is started on their first dose, or if we want to start a program where they can start their first dose or two when they're admitted to the hospital. And then they can follow up with esketamine at our clinic. Um, for the rest of the treatment course that will put you know north Tampa behavioral health on the map in Muslim chapel area as the 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 uh, uh, treatment location of choice for treatment resistant depression we all know wesley chapel is famous for the crystal lagoon uh, maybe maybe it should be also uh, famous for mental health care right okay future treatments where is this where is this going like from this point on like what are what is the future hiding well, the most exciting thing that is coming coming in in neuromodulation is actually accelerated TMS. We we have done accelerated TMS ourselves at uh, Florida TMS Clinic, but we have paused on it for now because most of our patients who are coming for accelerated TMS, they were coming for the convenience of just doing it in a week. So instead of doing one session a day, five days a week for six weeks, with accelerated TMS, you're doing 10 sessions every day and you're doing it only for five days. So that shortens the duration of treatment only to one week. It's extremely effective. It's it's, it's miraculous how effective it is. But then those patients are coming from out of town, other states, you know, sometimes other, even, even a patient from another country. And, and I, we wanted to focus more on our community. So, and insurance does not pay for it yet. Um, so I, I'd like to cater more to our patients who needs us, you know, for the long term in case that they need retreatment in the future or stuff of this sort. So we'll put the accelerated TMS uh, program on hold for now, especially that the FDA is going to review it and probably they're gonna give an authorization for um, or approval for accelerated TMS in the next year or so. So once that happens, then we're going to kind of advocate for insurances to pay for accelerated TMS as well. So patients will have the choice of either doing things spread out over six weeks or doing things kind of accelerated in an intensive course. There is the future of individualized neuroimaging navigated TMS. That's what I talked about with functional MRIs or in the future, even EEG guided TMS, you know, getting, getting the EEG waves of the brain and adjusting your treatment according to that. And also in the next couple of years, we have TMS and ketamine at the same time. So, you know, if somebody is doing TMS and then we start as ketamine in the middle of the treatment, we're having two reasons for neuroplasticity to induce that change of your brain circuits at the same time. That could be also superior to one of them uh, on its own. Uh, this is our team at the Clinical TMS Society, uh, West Palm Beach, you know, just in June, um, presenting our accelerated TMS data, uh, CEO of Magstem, you know, on the right side of the picture. So uh, what else for the next 10 years to 20 years? So we have psychedelics, other types of psychedelics. We're talking about magic mushrooms, psilocybin. We're talking about LSD. We're talking about MDMA, you know, as I know a lot of you who work in inpatient settings and you've seen the negative outcome of uh, drug addiction, you know, kind of get scared when we say those words. But if you are prescribing medications under very strict monitoring program, you can actually save lives for patients who have severe, severe suicidal ideation and severe depression. Please be very cautious here. Do not push your patients to go to off-label ketamine clinics. There is something that is FDA approved that is esketamine. You know, it is available. They can actually seek this treatment. It does have safety data. So we don't want to turn this new solution to the next opiate epidemic, right? We already faced this back in the 60s and 70s. We don't want to repeat the same mistake again. So we have to be very careful when we're recommending psychedelics for particular patients or recommending, you know, neuromodulation techniques and what have you and stuff of the sort. And uh, the, the next thing is like what Elon Musk is working on. You probably, everybody knows who Elon Musk is creating, creating the fastest electric vehicles and, you know, going to Mars. But if we, if we bring him back to earth, 
uh, we we would see that he's actually started a new company called Neuralink, which they're trying to work on microchip technology in an outpatient procedure, implanting a chip, you know, on the skull of the brain, and then having microfibers, electrodes, you know, go into the cortex of the brain and analyzing signals and over time trying to do some neuromodulation. I know it sounds sci-fi. And I know if you tell a patient who is worried about COVID-19 vaccine having microchip technology in it, when they hear that, like, I knew it, they were on something, right? <laughs> but yes, it, it could actually save lives in the next 20 years, whether we're talking about neurological disorders or patients who do have stroke and, and dead brain tissue, or we're talking about uh, patients with addiction problems or with depression problems and stuff of this sort. So stay tuned for those things. Okay, uh, so take home point. Depression is common, it's costly, it's difficult to treat, it requires multidisciplinary team, um, and, but the future is promising. And I know that we are facing tons of difficulties now, but the future, I'm, 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 I'm very hopeful that you know things are gonna get better from this point on. And that's what we faced as humanity. Look at what happened with coronavirus. We had one of the worst pandemic that the humanity could face when we put tons of money and tons of effort as a society together, we were able to come up with a vaccine for it, right? We were able to solve this problem. Yes, I know not everybody adopted it and that's where we have the breakthrough um, uh, that we're, we're suffering from now, but at least from the science standpoint, we presented the solution. So similar idea for mental health. Mental health is a crisis. There are a lot of people who are doubtful about you know, mental health and what have you. Ignore them and continue caring for patients who need your care, right? And try to be innovative and find the next step in treatment. And people who needs this, they're going to reach out to you and they're going to, 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 to take to take what you're offering. Okay, so I'm gonna open it for um, uh, questions. I see. Okay, so since we talked about therapy and TMS at the same time. We, we do refer our patients for therapy when they start their TMS. And I love that some actually um, uh, uh, give us their, their information. I would love that you talk with Alexa Sali, uh, call our clinic. I think the easy way it's 813-TMS-BEST, uh, or you can just Google Florida TMS Clinic. Please talk with Alexa Sali. Tell her where, where, you, where you are, whether you do telehealth or not, you know, for therapy, what insurances you do, and what is the skill that you have, like what type of therapy uh, you, you prefer the most or you're, you're really good at, and what is the best patient, like who do you cater to, who do you serve the most as, as a therapy client. We always, you know, are on the uh, lookout for good therapists to refer our patients to when they, when, when they start TMS therapy. Okay, uh, let's see if we have questions. Okay. Dr. Barashi, we did have um, another person that was attending that unfortunately their, their Zoom failed them as well, um, but they did email me a question. Uh, I believe you did discuss this a little bit already, but just to ensure that he um, gets a gets a full answer on this one. Um, his his question was, um, can you discuss the um, maintenance session protocol for TMS and how effective is it? Right, excellent question. So. With TMS therapy, what we're doing usually is that we are uh, doing one session a day, five days a week for six weeks of 30 treatment sessions. If a patient is responding, they're one out of the two thirds who respond to the treatment, we do something called taper off. In taper off treatment, we're doing three sessions in week number one, two sessions in week number two, and one session in week number three. So this way, we're not stopping the stimulation of the brain abruptly. We're actually doing it gradually. And generally in psychiatry, that's always a golden rule, right? You know, never stop a medication abruptly, never stop. Even if you're doing therapy with a patient, you probably just want to keep in touch, you know, kind of tapering down the frequency of your therapy. So similar thing with, with TMS. And actually that taper off protocol is actually paid for by insurance. So this is something that they would do. Okay, then what do we do after that? Do we just, you know, call it a day? And we're happy and there is no problem and the patient will continue. Well, the jury is out on this. Some are saying, let's do maintenance TMS. Let's do one session every week and make sure that we keep an eye on the patient thereafter. Now, the problem is the data behind that is not as strong as what I just described with one session a week, five days a week for six weeks and then taper off after that. So insurance are going to say, oh, I'm out of here. I'm not going to pay for it because the evidence is not that strong. So it becomes a burden on the patient themselves to pay privately for that maintenance TMS uh, uh, treatment. And they usually go, the most commonly used is one session every week. Um, what is my opinion on it? My opinion on it is that 
When we do TMS and we're doing fine, let's do the taper off, stop the treatment and monitor the patient on a monthly basis by the TMS doctor. So I continue seeing my patient every month or every two months to make sure that things are okay. Data shows us that about two thirds of patients will maintain their uh, remission or response, whether they got remission or response for the next six to 12 months after the treatment. That's two thirds of the patients. One third of patients will have a recurrent depressive episode by that time. That one third of patients, if you put them back on TMS, if you give them a full course again, they have about 80% chance of responding in the next, next course of TMS. So remember the first course of TMS, you had about 58% response rate. With that second course of TMS, now you have about 80% response rate because you know what worked. You know, the brain is already, uh, you know, uh, 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 we know that this particular brain responded to brain stimulation Simulation. So that would be higher chances of them responding again. That patient then with the second TMS course that I do for them, I would tell them, you know what, now it's time to actually put you on maintenance TMS. I want you to have a session every week. Why? Because I want to prevent that third episode from happening. There is something in psychiatry called kindling. You guys on inpatient would know what I'm talking about. Patients who have more recurrent episodes, they're more likely to have the next episode sooner and more severe. So that's called kindling in psychiatry. So if my patient had two episodes and I was able to bring them out of it, you know, with brain stimulation with TMS, I better than put them on a maintenance course. So I will prevent that third uh, uh, episode from happening sooner or more severe. That's an excellent question from, from who asked. Um, everyone else, you're welcome to unmute if you want to ask a question directly or type it in the chat. You can either tap it or if you want to join us and ask the question uh, uh, directly, um, I'm happy to listen to it. And if you have any other thought as well about psychedelics, the future, I know a lot of people have this debate about med medical marijuana and what have you. So if anybody has any question, I'm, I'm happy to kind of share my thoughts on it. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I guess I guess that concludes it. What what we're going to do? We're going to share the recording, hopefully, uh, with with people who intended to attend but they did not get the chance to. And I might actually share it on our uh, YouTube channel, um, Florida TMS Clinic, um, as well for educational purposes. If somebody wants to kind of share it and kind of kind of see what benefit they will get out of this. Um, all right, folks. Well, it was really nice, you know, being with you. Hopefully, hopefully, if it's helpful, you know, we can do some some more of this uh, in the future and share share more thoughts with uh, with you guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Barashi. I know that um, I think everyone on here will definitely be looking forward to more presentations um, where you are presenting. Um, Sorry again for the little hiccup at the beginning, everyone, but thank you for sticking with us. I did get all of your licensure numbers down, so we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. Uh, but thank you all again um, for taking time on this Friday, and thank you, Dr. Borashi, for the amazing presentation and great information. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you.